Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Where did the Book of Mormon take place? Most people think it was in North, Central, or South America. We're going to talk about the most unusual theory among all of the theories, and that could be the Malay Peninsula, as in Malaysia, as in Southeast Asia. Now that probably might knock some of your socks off a little bit. It's a very unusual theory, I admit it. It's a fun theory. And so we'll find out more about how Casey Kern got acquainted with this. And uh, it's, it's, it's a fun theory. So check out our conversation about the melee theory with Casey Kern and Greg Pallone. Well, there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about on a completely different subject. And um, uh, that would be on Book of Mormon geography. And so um, I know Casey, in fact, I, I do have a question for you. I do know, as far as the Mormon cave goes, you've written some stuff on uh, rational faiths. Is that uh, right? Th that's right. Yeah, there's two two documents, one archival.link that kind of has the story. And then the one on rational faiths is more of a, a personal reflection. Yeah. And also, you've written at Wheaton Tares. Did you ever write at Mormon Manners? I can't remember. It seems like you've, you've back done a in its early days. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I remember you first for Mormon Matters, and then I was really excited because um, I swear I was the only one who had ever studied the melee theory okay. of the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. and you had written uh, some some posts about that theory. Um, I think it's the. Uh, one of the strangest theories that we've heard. It's, it's, it's actually one of my favorites. Um, it does seem to uh, take care of a lot of the anachronistic problems, but of course it's got its own it, it does, issues it has its as own well. Issues. So, uh, so Casey, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, actually, I'm curious, Greg, have you heard about the melee theory? Absolutely, and, and I've read Casey. Casey's paper and we've talked about it at length, yes. Yeah. So I will tell you, I uh, I first discovered it, God, it's probably been about 10 years ago. I actually wrote uh, Ralph Olson, who's a professor up in Montana, a letter. And I've talked to him a few times on the phone. Unfortunately, he's passed away. So, um, so Casey, I think you're going to have to be the, the, the next best expert on this theory, um, if you can tell us a little bit about it. And how did you first learn about it? I'm curious about that, too. I'm only an expert because I read Ralph's book. <laughs> and and so you can be an expert too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, let me let me back up and, and kind of uh, mention how I how I even stumbled into this as a as a point of interest at all. Um, I was uh, my senior year at BYU. I was uh, uh, I had finished all my religion credits uh, to graduate, and our our bishop had said, you know, if you're not in a, in a BYU religion class, you need to sign up at institute. You need to be enrolled in an institute class. You know, kind of gave us laid down the law so we're to, so we're to our, our student ward there. And so, so you know, they, they kind of handed out, well, what are your options? And one of the options was uh, the, the university, uh, Utah Valley University Institute. Uh, you know, that's not a church school, but they have a, a huge institute program um, with a, a big menu of classes. And, and you know, some, uh, uh, the selection is, is quite broad there. And I was looking there and there was actually a Korean Book of Mormon class uh, taught by a, a Korean teacher uh, and kind of targeted towards uh, Korean Latter-day Saints in, in the area. I was like, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. So I was, I'm attending this, uh, this BYU class, I mean, this uh, Book of Mormon class in Korean. And at one point the, the teacher, he brings up this article and he starts telling the story of this group of people in, in Burma that have a story of, a, of golden plates and a lost book of gold and, and a story of, of, you know, brothers fighting over the words of God and the, the family splits and there's, they'll, they'll one day be restored. And, and, you know, the, the, the teacher's just like, Hey, yeah, pretty cool. Huh? And, and he kind of, his conclusion was, and you as Koreans, he's talking to a mainly Korean uh, audience, you can have your own lands of promise too. So his, his point was kind of like, Hey, you know, God remembers everyone and everyone kind of has, everyone is remembered by God, regardless of, of, uh, of, of ethnicity and, and a point of, of origin. But, but I'm just like, well, aren't you good? Like, you can't just leave it there. Like, wh who is this group that has this, this golden plates right. legend? So I, I go home and, and I start looking up and find some articles about it. It's the, the people are called the, the Karen. They're an ethnic group. They're a stateless ethnic group. They're mainly in Burma and parts of Thailand uh, right now. And it's spelled just like we would spell Karen, right? Is it spelled the same it's way? It's spelled Karen. I think it's, it's pronounced Karen, uh, although you know, okay. it's, it's kind of over, all over the map. And so I'm like, okay, well, that, that, that's interesting. So I read it. They have this millennialist tradition. Uh, they, 
and and apparently when the um, uh, one book I did come across was was this one called uh, it's called Eternity in Their Hearts. This is kind of a, a Christian book. Uh, it talks about missionary efforts to various parts of the world where they where these groups that were encountered by Christian missionaries kind of already knew the story uh, or had you know flood myths and you know Eden narratives and and stuff like that. And the Karen are, are mentioned in that one, and they actually all became Baptist very very quickly. Uh, it was, they were, you know, their traditions aligned so well with Christianity and, and you know, the Judeo-Christian narrative that, that they completely uh, came on board. And, you know, so it's kind of hard to sell, well, how much, how much, you know, um, mythology contamination was there. When it's talking about their own, their own myths, much of this is coming from through, filtered through Christian missionaries. So there is some bias there, but there's enough to, and, and again, just just to see how rapidly the the people kind of became Christian from their own traditions, there's, it's it's worth worth uh, you know paying attention to. Um, so okay, so this is in the back of my mind. Meanwhile, um, at the time I, I was building uh, the site Book of Mormon online, and and one of the the se sections of that is kind of a map room. And what I wanted to do was to outline and to sort out every single you know major Book of Mormon geography theory. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, it was here, it was here. It's like, okay, tell me where Zarahemla is, tell me where the River Sidon is, tell me where Bountiful is, where's the narrow leg. And that to be taken seriously, you have to answer to all of those things. So I took the ones that could answer those and kind of compiled them and kind of put them in a side by side. I eventually concluded that, you know, they all have problems. You, you can't square the circle with any of them. And they all have strong points and they all have straight weak points. Um, as I was doing this, I came across this book from John Sorensen. It's called Mormon's Map. Mm -hmm. uh, now, mm -hmm. John Sorensen is kind of the champion for the uh, uh, Mesoamerica theory. He, he wrote uh, Ancient Setting for the uh, Book of Mormon. Um, but this book was kind of written from a more abstract perspective. He doesn't mention Mexico at all, but he kind of does, based on what we know internally about, about the references and the relative positionings, any theory needs to conform to this or can be tested uh, according according to this, and he has as part of it an actual uh, you know map that you know explains the narrow neck and the the, the Sidon River floodplain and 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 things like that. Um, so you know I had this in my mind like this is this is the this is what right looks like to to some extent, and then it's like any proposal be that Heartland or Baja or Panama or you know hemispheric or whatever kind of has to be superimposed here, and then you can kind of give it a score you know how many hits how many misses. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sorting through these again, I'm, I'm not investing in any particular, oh, I know it's Mexico, or I know it's Baja, or I know it's Heartland, because I'm just like, you know what, you, you push hard enough on, on any of them, there, there's, uh, there's going to be, there's going to be enough problems with, with any of them that, or, you know, enough explaining away that you're going to have to do uh, for any of them. But still, I have this idea, and I'm just happy just putting out all the theories and being like, well, here, you know, this is, this is what we got. It is what it is. So, so with the, with that in mind, I, uh, I I encountered this this I don't know, I can't remember where it was honestly I think it must have been a, a blog post I don't know if it was on Mormon Matters or you know the blogosphere circa 2006 2007 um, there was some comment ab about it and uh, you know it was like Malay theory Malay theory and I, I just seeing it seeing it and it it just did not register or it was just like you guys like it was like what the heck is is, is Malay like. But, but it, it kept coming up. I'm like, why do you go, why is he talking about the, the Book of Mormon in Malaysia? Like, this makes no, this makes no sense. And that was my reaction too when I first heard about it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's just complete like bonkers. It's like, why doesn't, why doesn't this guy get banned or, or, or okay. So, so then I just, I'm just like, okay, Malaysia, what are you even talking about? So I open up Google Maps and I type in, or Google Earth and I, and I type in, you know, Malaysia. And then there's Google Earth starts spinning, goes across the world and starts zooming in. And I see it. I see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was a jaw-dropping moment. And it was like, has, like, how how has nobody noticed this before? Or or like, and then and then so you know that was just the, the first impression. And, and I'm and I, I start digging in, uh, digging in more, and then I, I come across Ralph Olson's work, um, and and where where he basically proposes that that the Book of Mormon. Uh, took place on the Malay Peninsula and the narrow neck and the land northward and the, neck and the land southward. Uh, it's it all took place there. And that Lehi and his his family um, 
left uh, the Arabian Peninsula and kind of traveled the coast around India, the Bay of Bengal, and then then landed and stayed in uh, stayed on on the Malay Peninsula. Um, and and th that's just that's just so like wait what? No no, Book of Mormon is about America. <laughs> Uh, and, and so the first concession to, to make is, is this is absolutely 100% incompatible with, with any uh, traditional uh, reception history of, of the Book of Mormon. And, and that has to be uh, established up, up front. Uh, you can't make it work uh, pretty much at all. There, there's no question that Joseph Smith and early saints and everyone, this was, this was, about, uh, this was about America. Um, but that said, if we just just go with just what the text says. And, and the, the example that, that I like to think of is the, um, oh, I forget his name, the, uh, 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 the, Italian, the Italian guy that encountered the Book of Mormon. In the trash. Yeah, in, in, in a trash can without a cover. Oh, um, uh, the, Vincenzo di Francesco. Yes, yes. Wow, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> but from his vantage point, so he doesn't know, he never met the missionaries, he never met Joseph Smith, doesn't know who Joseph Smith is, all he has is the Book of Mormon. The text itself. If he if he were presented with this, like like how much would would be incompatible? Uh, it's really hard to make sense of. But if you just approach it from from the vantage point of what does the actual text say, irrespective of anyone, what anybody, even people in, in, in positions of authority, had said about the text, it presents far fewer problems than almost any other uh, theory out there. Um, and. You know, there has I have done some follow up on it. Now I will say about about Ralph's work, he is a great researcher, but I think he's a terrible uh, rhetorician. His the, the rhetoric that he uses, he kind of pits it. He's like, oh well, Meso has this, and Malay has this, and he's like, well, what about this? Like a lot of the arguments that he makes are, are really terrible. So I, I really would not um, necessarily recommend uh, his book as as a thing to be convinced by. But his footnotes. And, and the research that, that he's done in terms of, of putting together the, the pieces, I think is, uh, uh, I think he's he really, really did something remarkable there. I mean, the, the thing that I like about it, um, and I, I'm like you, I, liked, I just like to study all the theories. I like to lay them all out. Um, but they have horses, they have elephants, they have um, all the anachronisms that, that people point out. It's not a problem in melee. Um, Another thing, if you if you look up on apologetic sites about like ancient evidence for golden plates, um, you'll find some stuff from like Persia, from um, some stuff from the, the Roman Empire, uh, but there is a trove of stuff uh, from from Southeast Asia, uh, from from Burma in particular, that that the the tradition of of writing on on gold plates, and this is where this gold Bible narrative uh, uh, comes from. There's, you know, once you get into the weeds of like, who are the Karen in relation to the potential Nephi Lamanites, it starts getting complex. The, the Karen are not the Lamanites. You cannot establish that, but they, they may have shared space um, in, at, at some point uh, if, you, if you just lay out the, the, the chronology. So some of the, you know, the mythologies and, and stories could have gotten crossed over in, in the same way that, that uh, you know, the, the U.S. was kind of... Um, colonized by from two different sides you have the Spanish from the from the south and then uh, the, the British from the north and then, then you know French from Canada and, and Louisiana as well but uh, you know if, if you have a, a Hispanic American who's celebrating Thanksgiving you know celebrating the pilgrims or whatever it's like hey well you're not a pilgrim or, or what it's like at, at that point the fact that, that they're from different stock uh, and, and different uh, ethnicities is really irrelevant because you know the the, the culture there is a culture that crosses over um, based on that. So that, that's just a, a little side point there. But there's, there's, one, there's one thing that I think is, is really worth noting. Um, uh, what I have found is, is, as I've kind of looked into various um, geography theories, a lot of them turn into dead ends very quickly. Uh, and what I have found is that the, the Malay one, it has continued to be a fruitful line of inquiry, uh, meaning that uh, the more you press against it, the more it yields. And let, let me give two, two examples there. The Karen, but like I said, they're an ethnic minority in Burma and they've had a lot of military conflicts with the Burmese government. They've kind of set up their own militia. And in their history, and this is in, in the early nineties, there was this one confrontation where they, they kind of had this stronghold around this Oxbow uh, Lake kind of thing on, on a, a river on the border of, of Thailand. And they named that stronghold Kamura. 
I, I, I kid you not. Like I, 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 I read, I read this in a book and it's just like, Oh, the care, the Karen were, you know, their last outpost was Kimura. I'm just like, <laughs> like if, if, if any of this in any remote sense was emerging from the Ohio River Valley or from the, or the, from the Mississippi or from Chapas, Mexico, a lot of people would be making a lot of noise uh, on, on the apologetic side. Uh, the other thing is um, after I published the, uh, that, that uh, article on the, the blog, I got a, 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 a note from, from this guy in Kentucky and he says, I can prove this theory true. I'm like, okay, I'll buy it. So, so I, I respond, I, I, I get his phone number. I have a, a conversation. And he says that there were some, some Karen, Kareni, uh, some uh, students, there were refugees in the US, in Kentucky. And he was a, a shop teacher, an auto mechanic. And, and he had some students that, were, that he was talking to. And, and he had somehow gotten his hand on the, the characters document. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about? The one that was copied by by John Whitner, and, and it may right. or may not have been the Anton. And Mark Hoffman made a forgery of it too. Oh, right, right, or at least was was inspired by that. He he supposedly had that. You know, played there things copied from the gold plates. And and this this Karen student looks at that. He says, "Oh, I know this. This is chicken scratch script." And, and so it was just like, "What? Okay, what what is what is this about?" And so, you know, I look it up. The, the proper name for the script is called Leke script. It's unique to the Karen people. And they teach their youth, like in these camps, how to, how to write in this script. And I, I, tried, I contacted an, an expert in the script. There's not a lot. Uh, and I, I gave them the, the character's document. And, and can you, I'm just like, is this, is, does this check out? Is this, does this look familiar at all? And, and the expert said, well, you know, there's many iterations of it uh, and had examples from the 1800s and stuff like this. And I'm like, this is coming from, you know, uh, from 500 or from 400 AD. It, it's, it's not gonna be a, a match, but, you know, mentioned that there were certain characters that, that looked similar. Mm. At that point, it's like, yeah, I know Dan Vogel is just like, oh, well, he's just one, two, three, four, five in Arabic numbers and, and just kind of re reconfiguring them. The, the characters are, are simple enough and abstract enough that you can kind of squeeze in anything. But, but just the fact that, that the aesthetic was completely unsolicited, recognized by a, a Karen student and made enough of an impact that they contacted me out of nowhere uh, in, in response to the article. It was just like, whew, like this should not be happening. If this is completely, completely nonsensical, we should not see any of this. And if anything like this was happening about Mayan glyphs, you know there would be an, you know entire volumes of, of apologetic works written about it. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Greg Pavone and Casey Kern. In our next conversation, Casey's going to describe the path that Lehi likely traveled on the sea, and it goes by a very familiar place. For anybody uh, that, that really has, has hung their hat on the Mesoamerican theory. If you, if you watch the, uh, the Journey of Faith documentary that, um, that kind of uh, talks about the, the, the trip out, John Sorensen actually yeah. kind of walks through what he um, supposes the trip from Arabian Peninsula to you know, the West Coast of Central America mm -hmm. would have looked like. And he says, you know, just realistically, you know, it, the text just says many days. You can't get much out of that. But if, if they're really on a boat, and they're, they're probably you know, following the coastline and stopping for water and stopping for food along the way. Well, John Sorensen draws this map of like, you know, kind of through along the coast and kind of down the, the coast of India and then up, and then you run into the Malay Peninsula and, and he kind of has them going, going along the side on the west side and then, and then through and then into the Pacific. So uh, what that means is that even if you don't, if you, even if you don't put any stock into the Malay in theory at all, and you're more of a, you know, this is definitely Central America, or, or you have to acknowledge that Lehi and Nephi set foot on the Malay Peninsula and stayed there at least as if for a pit stop. Like, let that sink in. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com 
slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just click the yellow subscribe button and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.